G'day everyone, Matt Elder of MattElder.com here, and in this video we're going to look at what we're calling our Lego Scenario Creation. You might be looking at this and wondering what exactly it is I'm looking at. I'd like to think of it as a Lego version of a snow globe or a diorama. Think of it as a cross between Lego building with Macropolis, Mosaics, Technic, Architecture and Dot techniques all thrown into the mix. Add a little motion and wrap it up in a narrative. This is a Family Bricks video. Be sure to hit that like button, share, and if you want to be super awesome, subscribe. Click the bell and select all to be notified of new videos as they're uploaded. In this video, we'll be covering what these Lego scenarios are, the main components, a look at the three different themes created here, the standard developing, look at the individual components, the gears involved, origin of the name, and ideas on the future direction. This is going to be a longer than usual video. The concept is based upon wrapping one of these new Lego Dots bracelets around a standard Lego wheel. Once you do that, you pop the axle through the wheel and it opens up all sorts of possibilities for motion and storytelling. Sometimes I have to think this would have been the furthest thing from the minds of the designers of the bracelets. That is the joy of Lego. People will mold it for their own uses beyond its original inception. Here we've themed out three scenario examples, one being based around Star Wars, another being the City of London, and another the famous 19th century Japanese print, the Great Wave of Kangagawa. Each of these having varying levels of complexity, so hoping to create an entry point for the various ranges of abilities. These scenario boxes we like to think of as blank canvases or frameworks. Then they can be skinned or themed out in any creative way you can think of. A lot of the time when building something mechanical with moving parts, it becomes a single-use design and can't be adapted for anything else. The goal was to try to come up with a universal base design so don't have to keep reinventing the wheel each time. So a fair amount of time was spent on the engineering side, prototyping, reaching dead ends, cycling back and starting again. I'm not a technic guru and know enough to get by. I'm sure these can be further refined by experts but gives a solid foundation. At this size, feel it will enable one to create scenarios based around favourite scenes from books, movies, TV shows, artworks, cities or any other popular culture idea or subject matter. It also means you don't need thousands and thousands of pieces and months to build. Thus, it helps to keep it accessible to everyone. There are four main components to a Lego scenario. The action or wheel box, the front display portion, the billboard, and then a drive source, whether it's by hand or by some sort of motor. Designed it around a 16 by 16 plate and interconnecting modules. This seemed to be striking a good balance between size and ultimately cost. It hooks into the already existing design language of micro builds. Connections can be made to Micropolis layouts and add motion to their cities. Let's start off by looking at each of the three themes that we've done here. This is the Star Wars scenario. It's based around episode 4 apart from the minifigs. The front box has the trench run scene with Luke's X-Wing which can move side to side. Also has a gun turret that spins around to shoot down rebel ships. There is a maintenance panel which opens so you can get in and make any subtle adjustments to the gears if you need to. This is my first serious attempt at any greebling or creating the hint of detail and it was a fun process. Moving to the action box you have the rebel ships flying in one direction while the empire ships on the other two wheels flying in the opposite direction to intercept. Ships that you have here are a handful of TIE fighters, Millennium Falcon, uh, some couple of Star Destroyers, TIE Bomber, Tam TIE 4, small little X-Wing, and of course the iconic Millennium Falcon. A few of the colours might be slightly off, but just dealing with the colours and pieces that we have available to us. On the billboard, we have the Death Star in the process of firing the primary weapon. The Death Star itself has a light relief effect going over four tiles in height. Tried to have the main dish a little countersunk. Being 16 bricks wide, think it has a nice orbiting effect. The other scene is from the climax of Empire Strikes Back with Luke and Vader fighting it out on the Cloud City platform. Being challenging to create the platform in alternating one and two brick wide sections, 
think it has turned out okay, but really opens up the possibilities with being able to include minifigs. Yes, there is some slight inconsistency with the scale, but think of it as artistic license. Like when you see a movie posters with giant background heads and tiny foreground elements. My apologies to any Star Wars purists out there. We are probably casual Star Wars Lego fans, so minifigs have all been mixed up and we only have a handful. Yes, I know Luke wasn't wearing his orange flight suit in this scene, but you get the idea. One thing to note, due to the tolerance of one of the Star Destroyers, the wheels only rotate in one direction, as this Star Destroyer can be massaged through that gap in going this direction, but if you try to do it the other way, it gets wedged and jammed. That's why you might hear a slight clicking sound as the Star Destroyer goes around. Next up is the London scenario. We'll start off with the action box, as it has the iconic London red double-decker bus. We've mixed up the colours of the bands as you go around to match the ground type. The first band is teal with trees and parkland type environments. The next band is a road with the bus, car and pickup truck. The next band is a train with some track. The blue medium azure band is the waterway with sailboats and a cargo ship. The last band rounds out with some more trees and foliage and a plane flying past. The holes that allow you to dress this strap on the band while you're wearing it here are slightly larger than a stud so if you try to put anything into that hole it's just going to fall out. We did find however that if you have a cone piece inverted and push it in it will start to clutch the cone piece. The clutch isn't brilliant but enough to hold the cone if you get it just right such as this tree here that's an inverted cone into the band there. If you don't have them in there, then as you can see here, you start to get holes and just doesn't fill up and look as good. Onto the billboard. The billboard is a 16x16 16 16 design, so you have to get creative with any mosaic image that you come up with. Here we've gone for Big Ben and clouds in light relief. The bottom three or four rows, you always have to be careful when designing as the pieces coming around on the bands can hit them if the tolerance is too tight or they stick out too far. The front display is a general water scene over some rocks. It gives you a way to get from the top of the action box down to any other Macropolis base you might like to connect to it. This scenario I did want to keep simple without too many crazy or elaborate building techniques. The five bands in the action box have gone a little overboard to show the possibilities of planes, trains and automobiles and everything in between. If it wasn't so much a demonstration piece, I'd probably lose one of the types of transport and just to let the action box breathe a little bit more and not feel as crowded. Lastly is the Great Wave of Kanagawi Japanese print design. I'm not Japanese, so sorry if I've mispronounced that. Here is laid out the moving billboard image and the design that it was based off. This shows that the Lego scenario can be applied to other media, in this case, artwork and designs. Again used a subtle relief for the depth as the waves in the front are slightly higher than the waves at the back. We've used these quarter circle tiles to give it a feeling of organicness as originally it felt a little blocky with just plain old square tiles on it. Also used transparent blue rounded studs of the blue plates to give a couple of subtle shades of blue. There is Mount Fuji in the background but like the original print, it is very subtle. Okay, so we've wrapped the design around the drivetrain for that, and now we'll move on to the middle wheel box. The effect that I was going for is the waves closer to you move faster and break more dramatically. The wave in the back has that effect of being further away, so slower moving and more subtle. Much like if you stood on a beach looking out at the waves, those closest to you are crashing with quick movements, while those that are further in distance are moving more slowly. The middle wheel has a fishing boat, also present in the original image, but it's more of a second read item. It travels in the opposite direction to the waves, and at a speed that is slower than the fastest wheel, but then faster than the slowest wheel, so it has like a medium speed in between. For the purposes of this demonstration, I've done the back two sides transparent. Thus you can see more gears and pulleys and what's actually going on in there. The front display is imagining what might be below the waterline, so very much where you can start to make your own creative interpretation of extending this scene. So there is some green seaweed locked in between 1x6x5 panels along with some transparent blue studs. In the middle is actually a whole section of these studs. I put a little wheel mechanism in there so it can turn up the studs. The mechanism is a little undercooked as the little studs can make it really difficult to turn and needs further refinement. 
but conceptually showing what else can be done here and trying to add a further dynamic motion of the sea churning. The standard. Just want to talk briefly about the standard that we've been developing around this, similar to how Great Ball Contraptions, GBC and Micropolis buildings have standards. Thus you can develop sections in modules that easily interconnect and switch around. In this case too, where there are standard configurations and components, the drive components can be more readily plugged in. Thus one can spend more time on just theming and being creative with the overall scenario than spending days pulling your hair out trying to develop the drive mechanisms and gears as I've done to date. The action box is built on a 16 by 16 plate. In the middle of each side at the bottom is a 1 by 4 Technic brick with three holes in it. This allows the modules to be interconnected on all sides. On the eighth high brick another Technic 1 by 4 with three holes is placed on two ends that allows the main drive shaft to go through it. This allows for the main axle height for any wheels to be placed on it. A drive motor is designed to be connected easily at this height. By doing so, it gives a one brick height at the base for any Technic gears and other axles to be out of the way of objects which might be turning or bumping into it. The height of the box is 10 bricks high with a finishing layer of tiles if desired. This can help to securely connect any bricks the 10 brick height also enables the maximum height of objects to be placed on the wheels. In this case, this is a three length bar. So it can rotate to the edge and all the way around without hitting anything and gives you the maximum height to play around with in styling and theming out the bands. The 10 brick height can also hide out any of the visual noise from the gears and pulleys. So it can just focus on seeing the actual elements themselves more. The 10 high brick also means the boxes can be placed in front of any GBC module and help theme out anything in that direction. On the back side, drive axles will run two bricks up high and three in from the stud position. They are generally designed with a Technic wheel knob on the left, sitting half a brush pin out, and a Technic 20 gear tooth bevel on the right, sitting flush. Thus they can connect straight into the drive mechanism because you can see here you have a matching Technic wheel knob here and a gear to drive the bevel there when it comes together. We've tried to design this so it's hot swappable so you can go through, connect it up like that, maybe tweak one of the gears in there which aren't sitting correctly but then could just go to keep it really quick, simple and interchangeable. Looking at the billboard module, you can see the gear and the Technic knob these will connect up to. For the time being, I've made this piece here easily detachable. At a later date, you could build in, but I find it's really handy for maintenance and if you're trying to design things out, being able to get in there and just move things around. It also adds support for taking weight from the upper part of the structure, so it can come down here or on these legs. You have space here for a power functions L motor to slide in and connect the main drive wheels. One of these here, and I've just added some lift arms on the bottom. And from the back, I'll just come in and slide in there. By having those lift arms on the bottom, it stops the motor from rotating around and can power the main action box unit. I did have it so you can have a couple of gears coming off here, which will then drive the main unit, but I was finding it wasn't providing enough torque for the designs which I've come up with here. The other motor to drive the unit connects in here. It's a bit of a basic setup at the moment and probably needs further refinement, but it just allows for flexibility while this is still being developed. Initially, these 40 tooth gears are all about slowing the motor speed down. The wheels and billboards don't need to turn at a great speed to get a nice effect. Actually, the opposite is true. I find the power coming directly out of the motors will spin everything way too fast and you need to slow it down. So you have the power coming into here. It goes along these 40 tooth gears to slow it down. On this one here, it then comes down to this corkscrew, which again really slows it down and it splits off into the other gear and the knob, which powers anything 
low down, such as these ones. If you continue along for the corkscrew, you come up here, over across this other 40 tooth gear, up to here, and then into this tan one, which drives the main unit of the upper billboard. All the while, that's just slowing it down. From the other side of this tan gear here, you have a black one there as well, and you can actually add in another two gears in there, so you could have a drive unit coming off here, which would then be at the right height for this. But for the designs I've used, I've just used the, the main motor there. If you only wanted to use one motor, then you have to have enough torque to be able to do so. And that rotates up and comes off easily enough. So you can always put different size motors or change the direction here. There's still plenty of space. To take the billboard off so you can swap over to another one, you just disconnect the 1x16 and a 2x16 adjacent to each other. That then gives you easy access to the treads in here. And you just need to jiggle them apart. It's pretty stiff. And then that whole unit there just pops off. And you can just pop back on the 1x16 effectively and a 2x16 on the other side. And you have your design back. So just move that out of the way. Looking at the unit itself, as we said, the main power comes to driving it through this tan gear there. As you see, just turn that. That then turns that whole shaft there. You then have the sprockets here and the two ones here then drive the main treads. So if we have our design from the front side like that and then on the back you can see there's two lots of treads each of 20 links. These are the treads with the two hole pins in the middle. And you can see then they just line up there on these two main sprockets to drive it. If you think normally you'd have tank tracks which would sort of go like that and then wrap around and drive like that, all we've done then is just taken that idea, put it vertical, and then we're putting lift arms and spacings in between so that the weight from the top can come all the way down into the supports and the pillars and onto the ground. So the main power comes up through here and turns that. And then you have the treads wrapping around it. We do have this other one here which will turn. Initially thought as you had the treads going around, there'd be enough power so that then you could turn this around and then from that have another axle here which could drive something. But I found that the treads just are a little bit too loose and this doesn't turn and it slips. But in the future, it could be adapted to either provide secondary power if you had a really heavy turning billboard. So the billboard is 16 studs high. You've got the two treads of 20 each going across there. So theoretically, you can have this at any height that you want. All you'd need to do then is just adjust this sprocket and drive unit here with these spaces. So if you wanted it to be higher, you put more of these spaces in so that it would lift it up. If you actually want it to be small or you don't have enough pieces, you could then just take this top one off and just have it there maybe being six or eight studs high. The billboard is alternating one by 16 and two by 16 plates. To create the one by 16, I've actually done it with two one by eight and then have a one by two plate in there to join it. I find this to be really flexible. So if you did want something much higher, you can then move this up and then you just maybe rather than using a one by eight system, you might have one by tens or one by twelves or whatever it is to get the height that you need. And in this instance where I didn't have enough of the two by sixteens, then when I got to here, I then started using two by eights and you can join them together as well. So you can then make it up of whatever components and pieces that you have around and not purely limited by if you don't have a two by sixteen or enough of them, then you can't build it. They're connected to the treads using half pins which plug into the anti studs. And there is always just something very satisfying about just having that roll over and hearing that click away. We use the Technic Link Tread Wide with two hin poles, number 57518 here. Surprisingly, with a layer of plates and tiles, 
this actual billboard does become quite heavy. You could possibly use the smaller 1x3 link treads, but they just, I think, unclip way too easily. And you saw previously, it was a bit of an effort to get the actual larger pinhole treads to disconnect. And even with that, I don't feel that that's about to unclip because you can place a one wide plate in and possibly generate the same effect. But the other issue with this is you're only going to have one wide on each of them. Whereas by having the alternating two by ones, it enables you to have more flexibility in putting slightly wider two by something plates on and having things like minifigs. And in this case, to connect the Death Star in there, you actually needed a two by one jumper plate and then putting some hooks onto the top of it so you could then clip onto the actual ring piece which is sitting in behind and then having the pole piece going in there to connect the radar dishes. I only built one billboard power unit but have two of these billboard tracks. That's why through the video you'll randomly see either the wave or the Star Wars design on the billboards. First up, remove the last 1x16 and 2x16 plate on each end of the treads. For the wave, you can just lie it down and I try to align the join over these lift arm L pieces. Thus when you push down, you have something offering resistance so it becomes possible to clip the treads together. Place the 1x16 and the 2x16 plate designs back on. 20 treads seem to be the magic number for this configuration. 19 was just too tight and wouldn't join. And there you have it, a billboard designed quickly and easily swapped over. I'll give the gears a quick test to make sure they are rotating freely. And now it's ready to be joined up to the action box. The front display I found visually works best when you're using an 8x16 plate. In doing so, the 1x4 Technic brick with three holes needs to go in the middle on the long sides of the 8x16 plate. On the short sides, on each of the corners, we placed a 1x2 Technic brick with a hole. Thus, two of these can be connected up and you'll still keep the 16x16 grid. And given that those are the holes there, they can then go and anchor into any other box. The Star Wars one does cheat this a little bit by not having one of these Technic 1x4 3 holes on the front, but that's because using the snot technique to get that front plate in place, but it still does have the two 1x2 with the hole on each of the corners. But that said, I'm also not anticipating having anything connecting up to the front on this one. It might be possible in the future to refine the crank arm which drives the X-Wing so it doesn't need to have this extra space for this plate on the front. Having all these Technic bricks in the same consistent place means if you were to put pins there, because they're all together, you'd then be able to join them together in a display like that. And you can imagine if you had them all in the same theme, like saying they're all the Star Wars movies, so you might have episode 4, 5 and 6, then it can be a nice piece all coming together. In the three boxes, we've generally been using these one by two by five bricks for the walls, but there's nothing really to stop you using anything else. It just helps to be able to build out the boxes really quickly by using large chunky pieces like these. We just happen to have a number of these pieces and recently they have been on the picker brick walls so you can get a cup full pretty easily. They're also pretty quick to optimally stack as they usually also have a plate of some description on the picker brick wall. So you can just grab the plate and then stack them in relatively quickly without wasting too much time. You know, get a, get a number of these going and then they fit not quite nicely even into a small cup. So you can get them really quickly and really cheaply. Gears. Quickly wanted to touch upon gears. In the London module, it is effectively a single axle that runs through all the wheels. It's actually made up of two Technic axles with a connector as you need at least a 17 length long to come out the back so you can have somewhere to put a handle onto. If you didn't mind the overhang out the back or somewhere, you could just use a 32 long Technic axle. This can be manually turned by hand if you didn't have any motors. If the speed seems a little fast, you can change this configuration on the back. 
Here I've replaced this steering wheel with a gear system and the basic way is to slow it down. So as you can see now, I'm turning quite vigorously and the wheel speed is much, much slower. And the reason for this is you have these gears here to slow it down. And the main way that it works is you have a little gear turning a big gear, which then comes through to a little gear, which then turns another big gear, which comes through to a little gear, which turns another big gear. And that's how that mechanic works to slow it down. Just for illustration purposes, I've taken the billboard off, which would yeah just sit straight in there. So it's relatively easy to change these over, but just shows how, you know, with a relatively simple modification, you can start controlling the speed and in either directions. Here I've built a pretty basic sort of Technic tower for a motor. All it really is, is one of these square ones here as a base, have a few lift arms going straight up. This is really important as a cross brace as it stops it from wriggling from side to side. These are just a couple of Technic 1x6s with holes in it and then a motor sitting on top and depending upon the size of the motor you're using here I've just used a couple of 2x6s to give it a little bit of additional height. So you literally just take the crank handle off there. I've got that around backwards. Motor sits in there. Plug that into there. Just make sure that's all nice and aligned and then turn it on. I have one of these older style nine volt railway controllers and as you can see there, I've only just turned it just a little tiny bit. So you're not giving the motor much power, but it's giving it a nice speed. On video, this might look a little slow just because of relative sizes and the way that video skews thing. But if you turn it up, or if you turn it the other way. So that's the main idea with this one. You just have a single axle through there onto a hand crank. That can really be good just to get you going. And then after that, you can make some modifications to then put a motor or another hand crank on it to slow it down if you need to. The only thing to note is that because you're using a combination of Technic bricks and lift arms, it takes a number of holes for the alignment to match up because they're not quite 100% the same, they're slightly different. Just another angle to give you an idea of that gear system. You can see this gear is moving really fast and then by the time you get down to here, it moves quite slowly. And you can also feel the resistance, like that's fine to turn. This one here you can turn by hand. This one here you can kind of, but you're really feeling resistance. But by the time you get down to this one, it's really wedged in there. And you can sort of see just the top one here is only moving ever so slightly. Next up is the wave setup. And I'll just take this apart so you can get a better look at what's happening inside it. Okay. At the bottom, you have the two main drive axles. And on all the axles, at the bottom you have the same Technic wedge belt wheel on that side and then also on this side. You can see the orange one there and then a grey one in the back. So down the bottom is all the same and you get the different wheel speeds by the different size pulleys you have at the top here. This is done with elastic bands. You can sort of see in here, there's the black one there, just trying to get the glare. There's a black one there coming off the orange wheel, I'm trying to turn it, see. And then on this side here, you got another two of the black ones. You can see the, the one in the, the front, not the one clearly at the back. Which then those elastic bands or rubber bands come up to there's a drive wheel there one there and then one there here you have the technic steering pulley large and then in here you've got the clear technic wedge belt wheel and then as you come over to this other one here it's a smaller motor nine volt micro motor pulley so you have a large wheel here, a medium sized one here, and a small one there. And that what, what gives the differing speeds as it's going through. 
based upon how I'm actually turning it on at the back. And that's what gives you the differing speeds. So you have the small one at the front, so this wheel goes the fastest, then this one here, medium size, so it goes the medium speed, and then the one at the back is the largest wheel, so it goes the slowest. So there's lots of flexibility in here. If you want different configurations, all you really need to do is just move around the size of these wheels. So you could have three of the same to have the same speed, or if you put the big one at the front and the little one at the back, then the front one here would go the fastest and then that would go the slowest or however you want to do it. So it's really flexible in that way. And then to get the two different directions, one turns one way, one turns the other, so depending upon which direction you want, all you really need to do is just move the pulleys at the bottom from either side and swap them over or however the configuration you want to do. So it's really flexible like that. The one thing I don't like about it, however, is you've got the rubber bands in there, which if you leave them, then over time they're going to stretch and it's just going to wear out a little bit. Although it may look like there's a single axle running through it, there isn't. To get the independent directions, you've actually got three separate axles, which means on these Technic bricks here, each sits in half. So this little axle here will sit into half of this brick, and then this axle here sits into there by half a brick and the same there. So it's not ideal, and that's why you need these support pieces here, because if you don't have them here, once you put those rubber bands on, it's only hanging in by half an axle, so it can really easily pull it straight out. It's not ideal, but just given the 16 by 16 configuration limitation and trying to get three of these wheels in there, that seemed to be the best solution. Now onto the Star Wars action box. With the Star Wars one, I think it'll just be simpler to take part of it apart, take the side off so you can actually see what's happening in here. What you in essence have is a single axle which runs all the way through. So this is a 16 axle and there's a connector there, just there. So this is a, a three going into there. So with that single axle, just a little drive there. You, you turn that, it's relatively stiff and you need a lot of torque. And with that single axle, you can see that two of the wheels go one direction and the other one goes the other way. And the way that that is achieved is if we come around to the side, you can see the f these two have the green wheel rims in there whereas this one actually doesn't have a rim. What you're seeing in there, and I know it's hard because there's not a great deal of space, what's in there is a custom-built gear unit. So you've got the, the tan one which sits on the axle which provides the drive, and then you've got some small thin lift arms, and next to it on the top, the bottom, and the two sides are actually connected to that tan gear is small little black ones. So this wheel actually sits on all those gears and by the gears turning that then drives the center wheel which is why it needs a fair amount of torque because it's literally turning the rubber on itself. To do that it needs some resistance because otherwise it has nothing to turn against which is why you have a horizontal lift arm across there and then it comes down to this here to connect to the, the base which then provides that resistance. That's why when you look at this dots bracelet, it's all the way as far as possible off the wheel, because otherwise these Star Destroyers being larger size will come down and hit these in there. So that's a bit more of a complicated gear setup, but it's the way that you can have a single axle with wheels turning in alternating directions. And again, you could play with that configuration. So maybe you have this gear set up at one end so that you can have two going in one direction, one in the other one, depending upon what you want to do. So these are the three different wheel sizes we've used in these different LEGO scenario setups, depending upon what you might have available to you. So this is a 49.5 by 20, which means the diameter is 45 and the thickness is 20, which was used on that one. Then we have a 56 by 26, which was used on that one. And then this is a 56 by 28 ZR. Quickly wrap the dots bracelet bands around each of the three wheels. So that is the dots bracelets applied to the wheels. Now on the smaller wheel, the 49.5, you've got to go into the second hole. So there's another hole that you can adjust into there. And you can see that is a bit loose. So that's the problem we've had with this one is that these wheels in there, they do slide around a little bit. And in here, I've got a one by three 
tile which goes across and joins those two together. So it's a way of being able to fix them relative to one another. But the other ones, you know, you, you can sort of see there a little bit. They've got plenty of give and movement. And it does mean that over time, sometimes they do the bracelets slide this way. And then that starts just giving you a little bit of grief and problems with hitting the upper structure as they turn around. That said, I've just tried it. If you put it into the third notch, like so, you can actually get that to slide over that wheel and it's really tight. So a new discovery and probably just go back and tighten all those bands so they don't slip around as much. So that might actually work out quite well. With the 56 wheels, they actually fit on really snugly and it's on the last band there and I've never had any problems with these ones with them slipping around and that. So you can use either with the Star Wars one where the middle gear turns independently of the others, you actually need a lot of clearance and room in the middle to be able to achieve that, which generally you can only do with these 56 by 28 ZRs. There are other 56s. So if you compare these two 56s, the internal doesn't have much space where that rim is sitting. There are other 56s like this, but they've got a much thicker wall and they won't work. And that's the problem with these ones. These 56 by 28 ZRs are actually only in a few sets and a little more difficult to come by. So that just gives you a few different options of wheels that you might have in your own collections and some of the pros and cons with using each one. I find the process to the scenario building to be a lot like art and an art form. You're trying stuff, assessing it, removing or adding and then continuing. You're always making little judgments of how things look relative to one another. And it can also be a redactive process because originally I had some trees for this one which were done in a sand green to give variety as what it would be in real life. But I found because the sand green is more of a desaturated color, it was throwing the color palette off because most of the colors here are quite vibrant and heavily saturated. And then once we took that tree off, it all then felt like it was starting to come back together again. And even doing the waveform, initially trying it with square one by one tiles, it wasn't giving a good effect. It was blocky. So then coming back using the quarter circles and then originally trying the blue with the finishing being in tiles, it didn't quite look right. So then came back and then tried the round circle pieces on it and it's that constant back and forth and, and even on the wheels the front is a transparent light blue round stud whereas in the back you can't really see it but then there's the square block blue colors so it comes more like what's happening with the wave on the back form billboard and even with the death star planet shape just playing around with the different tans and light and darks and the light combinations here and even for the cloud scene here the black tiles, the one by ones, were originally a dark bluish gray, but then the characters were getting lost in that. And, and even though it's not showing up on camera, the black actually works much better in person. And it helps when it's turning around when you have the transition from the Death Star into the Cloud City room. As a process, feel very much it's the less is more approach. How do I represent complex detail with not very much? And that seems to be the challenge with this micro scale building. And it forces you, particularly with the billboards, where even with the rotating one there, you only have a total of 30 studs across and 16 studs down to do whatever picture it is. And then you're only seeing parts of it at any one given time. Even with doing a 16 by 16 flat plate like that, you still only have 16 by 16 tiles to play around with. Scenario name. As for the name scenario, there's a reason for it. In around 2005, give or take a year, Sid Mead released DVDs on his illustration technique. And there was these four DVDs here done by the Noman Workshop. You can probably go through and download these as digital downloads these days. But what was really fascinating was actually listening to the commentary on this. Sid paints in gouache, which is opaque watercolor, and he had been doing since the late 50s and his work is highly revered. Talk to any conceptual artist or designer and things like that, and they all know this guy and refer to his works often. If you go to his website, you can see his original film credits include the original Star Trek Motion Picture, Blade Runner, Tron, Short Circuit, Aliens, Time Cop, and so forth. And for something like Tron, he was the one who actually designed the light cycles that you can see here. 
but it was his illustration which really set him apart. He did illustrations for this US Steel series in the early 60s, I believe, and they're just so light and vibrant and full of life. And the story goes that when he decided to do his own book and self-publish, the amount of money that he made off that was equivalent to multiple years of his annual salary. So getting back to the DVDs, Sid would consider everything, which apart from his technical skill, I think he made his pictures so compelling. Here's just a quick Google search of some of his images. And on the DVDs, he was talking about scenario. He would think about everything that was happening in the scene, all the designs, what was the backstories, the mechanics for making cars and vehicles fly. So everything was really well considered, and I think that comes through in his work. So things had a reason for being there, rather than just looking cool. So the DVD commentary was fascinating to get an insight into his thought process, and he was always talking about the concept of scenario. So I just thought it fitted well into this idea because you're creating little scenes using a variety of methodologies and techniques and it just makes the most sense. And within that you're creating your own little narrative, you know, that going back to that original idea of it being like a Lego snow globe or diorama and thinking of all the different elements that go into the scene or the different aspects and building techniques and story that you're trying to put through to whoever might be viewing the object. And as an additional little tidbit, Sid Mead was actually at the same design school as another guy within a year called Ralph McCurry. Now, most people have no idea who this is, but you definitely know his work because he was the original concept artist on the Star Wars films. And this is all of his work. So he came up with, you know, the Darth Vader designs and he was painting in the same gouache sort of style. And we all know from there everything that spawned. And it's nice coming that full circle link coming back given that one of the scenarios initially created is one of the Star Wars ones. I was also fortunate enough that Sid Mead in 2010 came to Australia and he did some talks which he was able to go along to and it was just great to be able to just hear him speak and his ideas and approaches to things. So it's a nice segue from the visual futurist to talk about the future direction of the Lego scenario. Future direction. In the future, I plan to release videos that give breakdowns, time lapses, tutorials, and possibly instructions. Would be great to see others pick up the ideas and what people come up with. Hoping others can see and know of ways to improve and make this better. I'm not a technic guru. I know enough to get things working and to get by. Sure, experts looking on in horror as do some things which are clunky when there are much more elegant ways of doing things. Visit mattelder.com forward slash scenario for all your Lego scenario resources. It's a bit bare bones at the time of recording, but we'll be populating it with more content moving forwards. As for where this could head, I have many different ideas. I can see this as being really collaborative, someone working on the bracelets, someone else working on the mosaics, etc. Alternatively, pick a movie and each does a scene, or a trilogy and each does a film. Something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We plan to submit this to the LEGO Ideas site for consideration to become a future set. So if there is a link around this video, it would be fantastic if you can give it a vote over there. We can really see it as a canvas or a platform for a whole line of sets, which has scenes and storytelling inbuilt into it. LEGO could have base modular models and structure. Then they could sell different scene packs to theme them out and finalize the scenario. So the base might be Star Wars with Obi-Wan versus Darth Vader. The second pack might be Empire Strikes Back with Luke fighting Vader and the Hoth battle scene. The third pack might be Return of the Jedi and the Sarlacc pit with Luke fighting Boba Fett. Next obvious step is to add lights and sounds. Maybe create a programmable Bluetooth speaker that could sit within the model. Through an associated app you could record dialogue and have triggers. While I've been using the dots bracelet wrapped around a wheel, I don't think it would be too much for LEGO to make a wheel with studs similar to this one. can see it being really useful and having a full 360 degree ability to stud. Pretty sure the GBC community will pick up bracelets in some way, shape or form and really curious to see what they come up with. For mine, I'd also really like to see the dots bracelet made in white. It would give the greatest contrast and really make the tiles and the dots designs sing. Would also be good to have the dots bracelets in a red or orange or a traditionally saturated warm Lego color. The Lego scenarios also lend themselves to social media, pictures and movie clips. So if you do come up with a Lego scenario model, be sure to use the hashtag Lego scenario and we'll look to put links on the scenario page and in social media accounts 
accounts to feature your Lego scenario creations. Congratulations on making it this far into this video, that is a real accomplishment. Leave a smiley and sad face in the comment and I'll know you got this far into the club. What are your thoughts? Are you inspired to create any of your own Lego scenarios? Let us know in the comments below and I respond to all of them. This is a Family Bricks video. Be sure to hit that like button, share, and if you want to be super awesome, subscribe. Click the bell and select all to be notified of new videos as they're uploaded. Thanks very much for watching. Here are some other videos you might find of interest. And until next time, when we talk about all things Lego.